Thank you all, that was fascinating. And for our, our next panel, we're going to be discussing the promise and peril of human enhancement. And our moderator will be Lawrence Carter Long, who is the Public Affairs Specialist at the National Council on Disability. Good afternoon. I want to say thanks, first of all, to Future Tense and uh, Arizona State University, New America, and Slate.com for hosting this. And another big thanks to Reagan Bashir, who's the uh, director of the film Fixed, uh, which kind of brought us all here, right? The science fiction of human enhancement, which sets the context for this conversation. As she said, the, our panel is going to be is about the promise and peril of human enhancement. What we just talked about was engineering ability. Maybe a little bit more of the promise. But with every cost, there's also a consequence. So what we're going to be talking about is how new robotics and neurotechnologies are likely to affect the lives of people with disabilities. I'm going to start off by talking to Gregor Wolbring using some technology via Skype. Uh, Gregor is an associate professor at the University of Calgary. He is an ability the studies scholar, uh, an activist who specializes in the social, ethical, legal, cultural, and governance issues of new and emerging converging sciences and technologies and the impact of those. Gregor. Hello, oh, yeah. Lawrence. I'm fine. So I think we'll kick it off. I'm going to see if I can move. Can I move this at all so I can kind of see Gregor? Or should I? What's the best way to do this? It's never an event without a little bit of a, a switcheroo. Okay, that's good. Is this work for everybody there? All right. I, I also want to let folks know, uh, I know that this event is streaming over the internet, and there have been some questions about uh, captioning and such, that the event will be posted later with captions for everyone. So I want to let people know that. Um, okay, Gregor, let's get the ball rolling. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, let's do it. So let's start off maybe for the folks who don't know. Some might have heard of disability studies, but what the heck are ability studies? And yeah. I'm curious to know, how does this new tech shift commonly held notions of abled and disabled, or does it? Okay. Now, ability studies is a fairly new field. That's why very few people have heard of it. And it's really about looking into how ability expectations, hierarchies and preferences come to pass and the impact of such hierarchies and preferences on human-human, human-animal and human-nature relationships. Right? When you really look at your daily life, everyone has all kinds of ability expectations like I have to be able to drive with my car to work or, and we can go on and on and on with that. So countries also have uh, ability expectations, like they want to be more competitive, right, against someone else, some other country. So expectations of, right, uh, ability expectation can have positive enablement and ableism and negative consequences, disablement and disablism. To give you three examples for each, let's start with the negative ones. Ableism was coined as a term by the disability rights community. Um, to simply highlight that we expect from people certain species typical functioning with the body. And if you don't do that, you're labeled as impaired and you experience certain negative consequences, social reactions, right, the disabilism. Um, but we can talk about uh, the suffragetten movement and the women's right, right fight for vote. Male decided that rationality is an important ability. Male decided at the same time that women are irrational. And then they told them, therefore, you can't vote. Right? Or I think many people will um, remember the, the book Bell Curve. Right? We like cognitive abilities and we use cognitive abilities and the differences, so called differences between ethnic groups, then to justify certain policies. So, in essence, ability expectation of cognition is linked to racism. Now, three positive examples. Sustainable development was put forward by some as an alternative positive ability expectation how human engage with the natural environment and to rein in the as negative perceived ability expectation of uncontrolled consumption of natural resources. The proponents of the capability approach develop lists of abilities they think have positive consequences if implemented. And then sustaining a democracy is seen in need of certain abilities exhibited by their citizens. So from there you can see 
ability studies allows me to look really beyond um, right the obvious of a certain product appearing and beyond looking at just access, which is banned anyway because it's everywhere the lack of access. So um, that's why I set up in 2008 the ability studies and we worked on it. Right, quite a few scholars now to really go beyond and, and the dynamics of ability expectation and the governance of it. Now to the second part of your question around able to disable. Um, I want to give you the ex two examples. One is actually how Sputnik led to learning disability. Now many might not think, well, why, why would Sputnik be linked to it? So when the satellite Sputnik went up into orbit, um, people felt that, I mean, right, the Americans would lose out in, in the space and, and all the issues attached to it. So actually the requirements in schools were changed because they felt, well, obviously something is missing here. How could someone else go first with a satellite into orbit? And when as the requirements in school changed, all by a sudden a new group of students who were up to then labeled as normal, right, were all by a sudden not able to cut it anymore. And then they generated in 1963 a new label called learning disability, linked it to a biological problem, and then said, okay, my kid simply can't write cut it because it has a learning disability. Um, so there's actually a linkage of increasing a label and generating a new label of impairment linked to a technology which had per se nothing to do with the person but simply was based on that there were certain ability expectations, being staying competitive, security, and all kind of issues. Now, um, as to the panel part, right, the ability expectation of species typical, and that's also the movie my little one-liner says, is going out of the window because we can increasingly modify the body, whether through external tools or through internal tools, eventually genetic modification, which means the abilities the body can do will eventually change. Um, in Reagan's film, there is this one little piece where you see people in, in, in business suits racing on a tarmac. And that's exactly where, where we are going. I think we're having a red race of abilities and then the people who can't cut it anymore very likely will be labeled as the new impaired, the same kind of dynamic as what led to, led to the learning disability. And so you talked a lot about cultural preferences, which might be another way of saying prejudices, right? Or expectations that people might have. And those come down, I think, often to what stories were told, right? What is normal? What is enhanced? What's the big bag of expectations that we carry around with us when using those words? To your mind, when discussing these issues, when writing about these issues as, as you've done as a scholar and indeed living them, what kind of stories are we told? Well, I mean, we just study, for example, how the media portray bionics. Um, and we found that there are quite a few where, who's selling the negative imagery of confined to the wheelchair in order to sell the bionics because now you can walk and you don't have to be confined. So we see increasingly actually narratives of hierarchies of worthiness of assistive devices, which is of course problematic. Um, it's the same with the uh, exoskeleton. Um, they are often juxtaposed to you sitting in a wheelchair and now you can get up and you can walk. You could easily could have put them into a normal chair, like a kitchen chair, right? nothing to do with wheelchairs. Um, right, so we see that a lot. Um, we also see, and it's quite interesting, the Bremschen interface is a prime example for that. The invasive version is sold under the label of patient, and that was also the example in Regan's movie. But when you go to neurogadget.com, there are many non-invasive applications by now for brain machine, brain computer interfaces. And there, of course, no one is labeled as impaired right, or as a patient because they want to sort control Warcraft, right? So we see actually, uh, right, uh, uh, a split of how we sell and how we image, in essence, a person, whether it's right with the, how we put forward the technology. Um, it's quite interesting, this non-invasive, invasive one, because the New Fit Council of Bioethics in the UK wants actually to put every neuro interventions under, whether it's invasive or not, under, in essence, a health um, portfolio. So everything. 
So thing we think would fall under the FDA. Why don't you give us that last sentence again? I think you cut out for just a second. Okay. Um, the New Food Council of Bioethics wants every neuro intervention, whether it's invasive or not, to be run under a medical intervention because they all have some kind of implications. And that means everything would fall under the FDA. So that will have some consequences also, how, right, I mean, then in order to get products and deal with them, right, who is then seen as medical, who is not. So it's another thing about labeling, right? Got you. So one of the things we often hear, right, is, is that new robotics, new technologies are likely to level the playing field for people with disabilities. Do you think that's true? Why or why not? <laughs> well, I mean, my answer is banned from the, from the <laughs> right? No, it won't do it. Um, and there's no such thing. I mean, the only way it would be really do it, that everyone has, I mean, access to every technology. So A, um, we don't get rid of impairments because this needs all kind of different technologies. Um, right? Only bionic would not work for me. In order for me to give me a bionic leg, you would have to amputate my feet because I'm a solidomite person, so I'm not an amputee. Right? So there's all kind of things. Um, right? And then we would also would need a right whole list, right whole access, which of course is also not not true. And right, you would have to get rid of a negative rights framework, which means you can't stop me, but I have no obligation to make sure you get the same opportunities. Um, so on that level, whether we get rid of impairment, right, with technologies, uh, no. And, and I should say I use, of course, technologies, right? I'm one of the lucky ones. I can use computers and so on, and so they make me much more able than I otherwise would be in my academic work. But certain things would not work for me, right? That's why I still crawl at home. It's, it's so much more fun. Um, the so second part of you have also have to say about when you talk about does it playing field is about the social part, right? I mean, it doesn't get rid of impairment, but also it doesn't get rid really of the social discrimination, so really the disablement, right? I mean, we have technologies for a long time, right? It's just we're getting more. But for example, 84% of Americans with disabilities, right, are not in the workforce, right? That's, that's a January 2015 number. 84% don't look for work or are unemployed. Uh, and that number actually hasn't changed since 1901. We did a study and found the numbers right all the way back in the New York Times. And so, right, so the employment hasn't changed. The income really hasn't changed. So all kind of things, technology by itself can't do it. So if technology can't do it, we've got a social cost, right? There are social structures that are still in place. What would you like to see brought into conversations like these that we don't often hear about? What do you think is left out? Well, I think, and that's, as unfortunately, with science, we are going, and of course, there comes my background also as a biochemist. We have to overpromise in order to even be heard, right, to be flashy. And I think, and the last panel said, I think the same thing. That's a problem, right? Um, and technology can never fix social problems. Right? It's just if a, if, a, if a society is inherently set up in a way that it's inequitable, right, and doesn't want to write really where everyone is responsible for, for everyone, where you don't have a social contract, the technology itself won't do stuff. Um, it's, so it has to be much more talk around where we're going. It also has to be really about which abilities do we really cherish. I mean, if competitiveness is what drives one as a structure, then this comes to a certain consequences, right? If it's about, I mean, equity, then you can do other things. Technology is a tool, right? But to, technology can't fix social problems, right? And I mean, because the panel talks about, right, we, I'm supposed to talk about robots, let me just do that, right? Um, we, we, hear, we hear a lot about robots um, getting involved, whether, well, Maybe some people would even sell the exoskeleton as a robot, but we have by now service robots, we have right, industrial robots, and we get social robots, which, which are supposed to engage with people. And they're all supposed also to help at least the service robot and the social robot help right, disabled people, right? Um, but interestingly, what no one is looking at is what jobs do these robots take over? Right? And which, like people with what ability differences might be not able to go for certain jobs because that is simply taken by the robot. So there has to be more. We, we hear, again, when you look at the social robot literature, it's all about, yeah, 
it helps disabled people. And that's where it stops. It doesn't talk about, well, if in Japan now the first, I mean, hotel run by robots is opened, which jobs you won't be able to do anymore, and so on. So it's just too, it stops at technology, right, the salvation. And that's simply, I mean, right, where I think it has become much more differentiated, independent of the access part, because that's indeed, we hear this for every single intervention, access is an issue, right? So I don't even want to go down the access part, but I want really about what drives a certain, I mean, development, what drives what is seen as social innovation and so on. Wonderful. Thank you, Gregor. I think our time is done. Thanks for joining okay. us via Skype. I'll catch you online. Yep, thank All you. Right. Joining me for the second part of this discussion will be Julia Bascom. Julia is the Director of Programs at the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network, where she focuses on technical assistance for self-advocates and state-level policy advocacy efforts. Thanks for doing that. She also writes about autistic identity, community and language, disability rights, theory versus practice, and autism acceptance. Uh, to the far right, here from my right, uh, we'll have also have Teresa Blankmeyer burke Teresa is an assistant professor of philosophy at Gallaudet uh, University. Her work focuses on the space where philosophy intersects with deaf studies, including the moral justification regarding the use of genetic technology to bear deaf children and sign language interpreting ethics. So we're going to give them a second to get folks uh, tapped into the mics. I think I'll take the seat there in the middle. A lot more comfortable. One sec. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you joining us. So, I've got a question. You know, there's a lot of things here basically leading in from what Gregor had to say, right? There's uh, barriers to access mm -hmm. that often don't get discussed, except maybe in a nebulous sort of way. Could be money, could be education, could be privilege. I'm curious to know, if you get to the heart, I think, of Reagan's film, one of the things that's really beautiful about it is it essentially asks the question of the audience, what exactly needs to be fixed. Mm -hmm. How would either of you answer that question? Okay. I think it's a, uh, sorry, that's louder than I thought it would be. <laughs> um, it's a complicated question. I mean, there, there are obviously things which cause people pain. Um, when I broke my ankle over the summer, I was really glad that we knew how to fix that, that we had the technology to handle that. Um, I mean, at the same time, I've lived my whole life with a brain that works very differently from most people's. Um, and that's never struck me as something that's needed to be fixed. Um, when I think about the, the finite pool we have of research dollars and political will and policy changes that can be made, um, and I think about, you know, even just with my disability, and I think about the, um, the choices we have to make between um, creating another mouse model that might eventually tell us what gene causes some cases of autism and then to do what with that versus having some funding to enable um, friends I have who are 30 years old and who can't talk um, but who can type and enabling them to have a voice in their own lives. The, the choice seems pretty clear to me. Um, one of the things um, that was very interesting about the film Fixed um, was, I think this was Patty, was talking about a lot of these technologies are very interesting and they're very exciting, but there are still places all over the world where people don't even have access to wheelchairs. And, wh and what, what sort of ethical decision are you supposed to make based on that information? Teresa, what would you add? You going to voice it? Thank you for the question. Um, there's two things that I would add to that. First of all, I like how the movie really connected some of the assumptions that, uh, that we make in terms of 
questioning what needs to be fixed. Uh, in that, there's an assumption that something's broken. Who's broken? What needs to be fixed or repaired? And I think I'd like to reinforce Gregor's point about a uh, social attitude here. And I think that we need to start there. If ask ourselves, what does it mean to have human flourishing? Can I expand off of that point? Sure. And, and human flourishing. Mm -hmm. You know, one would think maybe that disability would be some sort of disadvantage. Right. Flourishing is a whole, ooh, I got loud. Flourishing looks at it from another angle, right? It's how can one prosper? How can one be the best? Yeah. Exactly. And I think also um, what we see um, with a lot of conversations around exciting new technologies is um, the potential for these technologies to let us get away with our biases and our fears about disability. Um, for example, um, the SSI discussion that happened on the panel earlier, sorry, the SSDI discussion. Well, the social security, you should maybe social spell it out. Social security. Oh, the social sorry. security discussion, sorry, that was happening on the previous panel was interesting. And it was also um, really alarming to me as someone who's working at a state level and working on, uh, with all these people with disabilities who want to work, but who are systematically prevented from working due to asset limitations, due to income limitations, due to employers who won't provide accommodations or who don't know how to provide accommodations or who simply aren't willing to hire someone who doesn't make eye contact, who uses a wheelchair, and who therefore are shut out of work. And we've been trying to fix that problem. Um, and would you say that that's more of an aspect of prejudice and an aspect of policy? I would, and, policy I would and I would say that we've been trying to solve that problem since, since Social Security has existed. Um, and the idea that what's ultimately, that, 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 the, that the policy pr proposal that might get momentum is funding devices for people um, to, to normalize them as opposed to breaking down these systemic structural barriers is, is alarming and also I think to be expected given society's current attitudes towards disability. Let's, let's talk a little bit about that tendency I think. You know, um, there is a tendency and it's very easy, it happens with me too, to get sort of enamored with the gee whiz aspects of technology, right? When you've got someone who's um, a paraplegic who's suddenly walking and kicking a soccer ball, when you've got somebody that's moving a bionic arm, uh, as was talked about earlier. But let's go into the background of those anecdotes beyond the public interest story, beyond the headline. It took more than 150 scientists and cost the Brazilian government $14 million. And I don't know if that's Brazilian money or US money, but that's the number I could nail down over the course of over two years to create the exoskeleton that was used in the World Cup that often gets talked about. Now, my question for you, if we're looking at the promise, but indeed what the perils of technology might be, how would you recommend using that kind of money? I think it's important to recognize that probably from the very beginning, it wasn't really planned to spend $14 million, probably. <laughs> and it was probably a series of smaller decisions, uh, starting with the idea of the project, perhaps. And then as they moved forward, they realized that it would qu required more investment of resources. And in the sunk cost decision making or mentality. And so they were at a point where they needed to continue, right? At the same time, I think we should look at our cognitive biases about social attitudes. Also social barriers and institutions that are in place. Even things like, uh, actually let me back up just a little bit. Uh, from uh, research that we've conducted on gender and race, we know that people have implicit biases. We know this. So, even if we were to change society's institutions and we were to break down racial barriers, we would still be left with some challenges in dealing with those more hidden biases. So when we ask how best to spend money, you know, the answer is so very complicated. 
and one needs to look at the whole process from the beginning, how it moved through, and to the end. I think that's really thorough. <laughs> um, and I also think um, we need to be thinking about, you know, every, every decision impacts some people and it impacts different people differently. And we need to be thinking about who's left out. I think Gregor had a really good point um, that for every exciting new technology we develop, um, there are going to be people who, for a myriad of reasons, can't use it or don't have access to it. And, and the panel before us also covered that in a lot of detail. Um, but what I'm interested in is the social expectations that start to arise as a result of that, regardless of people's ability to actually take advantage. I don't think we're in a world right now where it's an expectation that every um, paraplegic person can use a rewalk. Um, but I could see that happening very easily. Um, and so you would, would you see a bias, maybe theoretically speaking, where someone would say, well, why do you want a wheelchair? We could give you this well, exoskeleton. Yes, but I'm also, wh what does that do to access, to the concept of access? Um, if our focus is on enabling everyone to be able to walk up a flight of stairs, for example, um, or for my community, if our focus is on enabling everyone to make eye contact, then what happens to those of us who are never going to be able to do that, or for whom the technologies aren't present, or aren't paid for, or what have you? So those people who are left behind. Right. What, and what does that do to the, the rights we've spent decades fighting for and are barely even halfway to achieving? So in that regard, some would say, I, I know one of the quotes, the, the creators of the exoskeleton said, we hope that one day the suit will be able to help make the wheelchair obsolete. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering about that divide between the ideal and the real. And I was wondering what you thought about that. Do you think that's a practical goal? Is it advisable? Is it wishful thinking? Um, thinking? From your perspectives, are those kind of goals? You could say it about anything. You could say it about blindness. You could say it about being deaf. Um, do you find that goal exciting, problematic, or a little bit of both? Well, again, a complicated situation. I think what's really important to look at and or recognize is uh, having the conversation with disabled people themselves. And if you ask them about their preferences around whether they be in a wheelchair, and I don't know how to sign exoskeleton, <laughs> but um, even with all the resources available, asking them what are their preferences? Would you prefer a wheelchair? As an example, in my own personal experience, I have the ability to sign. I have a connection with the deaf community and signing. However, there are times when I can also talk and talk to my friends. I don't know if this lapel is uh, connected right now, but I have the ability to move between those communities and those languages. So the technology is not fixed. We wouldn't want it to be fixed so that you would force to pick one or the other. Um, I'm actually going to model my own assistive technology because I wrote down my answer to this. Um, I have some memory problems associated with my disability. And so I use my iPhone to remember everything. Um, many many people, many yeah. people. I feel like most people don't have to read from their phone <laughs> to answer a panel question. Um, and I think, I think the answer falls in a spectrum. You know, um, at the very beginning of the trailer, they were talking about, you know, like, legs that could make you really fast, that could make you fly. That would be awesome. That would be really cool. That would be enhancement of any, you know, baseline human thing. That's fascinating. Um, and then, you know, my iPhone for my memory is helpful. Would I want a, an implant or a pill I could take? I don't know. I really like the fact that I can decide when to use my phone and when to rely on other methods or what have you. Um, pain meds are great if you have, like I have chronic pain, and I'm really grateful that we have something for that. So there are things where um, it might not even be a question of fixing, but a question of accommodating or what have you. And I can see arguments for that. And I can see arguments for fixing things that, that hurt. Um, but at the same time, if I'm treating or masking my autism, I'm not doing that for myself. I'm doing that for the comfort of people around me. 
And I think that's the kind of question we need to be thinking about. I think it depends on a variety of contextual factors. Um, and I know a lot of people are inclined to say, you know, well, you can talk. So that's why you have this opinion about your disability. But I got to say, we have board members, I have friends, I have colleagues who also don't talk, but who can type or who can sign or who can do you know, a variety of different ways of communicating. And in my community, at least, with this disability, people tend to feel the same way. People really tend to feel that this is not something they want fixed. And that surprises a lot of people from outside the community, and it surprises a lot of non-disabled people. And so I think when we as a society have those conversations, the most important thing we can know is how much we don't know. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And yeah, I'd like to add to that. I think your point about pain and suffering is really critical. I think sometimes people envision getting rid of or eradicating disability and they're not really understanding or they think it's about pain and suffering. And they don't understand that sometimes a disability is not an experience of pain and suffering. And sometimes physical pain is really a social pain. And so there are both of those issues there. I also think that perhaps that we need to question the concept of disability itself. What counts? Who counts? Is having glasses a disability? If your brain works a little differently, Art, do you have a disability? If you're colorblind, do you have a disability? If you see a dress as a different color than somebody else does, <laughs> black and white versus white and gold, um, where do we draw the line? That's the question. And uh. can I, can I compl uh, complicate some of the stuff we're talking about with pain as well? Like, um, you know, um, pain is a huge part of um, my experience of autism. You know, if I was in charge of the world, vacuum cleaners would be a lot quieter. Um, so there's pain that's caused by society not being designed for people like me, for things being too loud or too bright or what have you. And then there's also pain that's just associated with, with the disability I have, with being able to be overloaded by very simple things. And what I always come back to is that even the pain that's not a social experience, even the pain that can't be fixed, um, through accommodations um, for my disability, in my case, is one of many things about that disability. And it might not necessarily make sense when I'm looking at the whole equation and the sum of everything about it to decide that since there is some pain or some suffering, you've got to get rid of the whole thing, you know? Right, and depends upon the context, too. If right. you're blind, for example, and the power goes out, you might be just fine when the rest of the world is trying to figure out how to get around. Um, so I want to make sure the audience has an opportunity to ask their questions. Uh, is there anyone out there who has something they'd like to ask? I saw your hand first there in the second row. Uh, hi, thank you for, um, for coming. Oh. Okay, I'll just sit down again. Yeah, um, so, so um, I know you guys are talking about sort of the the pain threshold for the people within the community as opposed to the people without uh, outside of the community um, and I'm I guess I wanted to know what sort of ethical issues do you guys see when this comes to a question of employment to where perhaps in order to stay employed a, por a person is first forced into a decision of of uh, perhaps eliminating an impairment that is not an impairment, which brings up so all sorts of other like social pains and things, and reacclimating themselves to that life. So bioethicists have um, a name for that kind of question or conundrum: the idea of elective disability. So, if you have a situation and for several reasons you're benefiting if you eliminate the disability or you add technology or you reduce the disability. Then there's a question about authenticity. 
and your ability to be and remain your authentic self. I'm a philosopher, so we're great at asking questions and not so great at answering <laughs> them, and I'd be happy to help you to more questions if you like. <laughs> Um, I'm not entirely sure if I understood the question, so I'm sorry if I go off in a direction you didn't intend. Um, but my impression of your question is you're asking about, um, you know, situations where there's just not an employer who's willing to employ you with a given disability. In order to get employment, you have to um, change or mask or overcompensate for various factors of disability. And I mean, that's that's a lot of the work we do is saying that that's not an acceptable situation, that um, there are certain laws, there are certain rights, and there are ways um, to enable virtually anyone to do virtually any job they want to do, and we should be focusing on breaking down those barriers. Um, I think Gregor had a really good quote earlier when he said um, that um, technology can't fix a societal problem, um, and that's what I would say. And I would also add that that's already happening. You know, mm -hmm. if you've got a situation where, let's say you've been doing manual labor for 20 years, that's your skill set and that's your career and you're, you have some accident or your knee goes out because of age or whatever it might be. You can't do that same type of labor anymore. You're then released from your job. You know, disability is, to the best of my knowledge, the only minority that anybody can join in an instant. Right? And so you see those kinds of things happening, either by accident, people coming back from wars, aging, whatever it might be. They're faced with those conditions. They're faced with those situations all the time. So I think it goes back to what Gregor said. That becomes more of a social issue, more of a social problem than one of technology. Um, other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, Dave Oxter, uh, Research Institute for Independent Living. Um, this question is about... Uh, technology and civil rights. Back in uh, 1971, before 71, uh, kids with disabilities were excluded from schools. <clears throat> the argument was that they can't learn so they shouldn't be in school. But the court ruled they should be in school because if you use the best technology, they could learn. So, you know, my question is, uh, are there initiatives where you can give rights to people with disabilities based on technology? I'm not sure I'm understanding your question completely. Um, I think one of the challenges is about limited resources and, and figuring out how to allocate what's available. And of course, society makes some decisions. And sometimes those resources are used for other things besides disabilities. And let's say a child doesn't have an opportunity or access to the technology that would then allow them to access education yeah, that feels like a rights issue. Now, when I was working in New Mexico, and I was working with some deaf and hard of hearing people there, and we had this one situation take place where a deaf child, actually it was a hard of hearing child, uh, had hearing aids uh, at school, uh, and this particular child wanted to bring them home and was disallowed because the hearing aids were the property of the school. So when the child went to school, uh, they had access, but that access was gone when they went home and they had difficulty communicating with their family, parents, and friends. That's a technology issue related to rights, to human rights. And we also see that um, in a lot of school districts where a student doesn't speak, but they have an iPad or a speech generating device or what have you. Um, and either they can't take it home, or maybe they get to take it home, but then they turn 21 and they exit the school system and they lose the device. Um, and they have no voice anymore. Um, when, you were f when you were first setting up your question, one of the things I was thinking of 
was how um, this is actually, it ties in really well with a lot of the stuff we've been talking about with technology because um, if you think about intellectual disability, um, before IDEA passed, there was no right to attend school. There was no right to receive an education. And it was presumed, therefore, that one of the definitions, one of the diagnostic traits for intellectual disability was that you couldn't learn. And now, over the past 40 or so years, we've learned a lot. Um, and we've seen that with the right accommodations and the right supports, people with intellectual disabilities are able to learn, are able to participate in the classroom, are able to do more than we ever thought possible. So that's happening on one hand. And a lot of the success there, especially at inclusive education, can be attributed to various accommodations, various forms of assistive technology, um, you know, um, being able to have notes with you, being able to use a calculator, being able to have the computer read the text to you so you don't have to read it, all that kind of thing. Um, and that's been a huge success. And that's a big part of, of my life, of a lot of people I know's lives. And now we're at a point where um, we're still trying to develop um, drugs to treat memory, to treat attention, um, specifically targeted at people with intellectual disabilities. And that's an interesting question. Is that going to become a part of someone's IEP someday? Um, you know, I, I talked about how I have almost all of my memories um, on my smartphone, and I know other people, you know, write everything down so they can remember what they did that day or what have you. Um, and it, what, what happens when someone's more comfortable making that choice and having their memory supported through that method, um, but everybody else um, is more comfortable or is participating more heavily in a pharmaceutical option? Um, do our choices then become more limited, you know, through, through social pressure, through what insurance companies will reimburse? It's a complicated question. And I wouldn't say, um, and I think, I think it's all part of that same continuum, though. You know, there's not a clear point where you go from, well, this is just accommodating to this is fundamentally altering. It's, it's a whole, it's all part of the same thing. And you can see how that ripples out throughout society. Right. I mean, it was disabled people who sued to get curb cuts put in sidewalks, which then later benefited people with baby carriages and right. pretzel vendors and suitcases, you know? So you don't often know, you don't always know what the benefits will be to everybody. Um, you know, uh, people who wanted Netflix to provide captions um, so that they could enjoy the films along with everybody else had to sue for that to occur. The technology, however, existed so the courts determined that, yes, they had to provide it, that that was reasonable. And it helps me when I can't understand the Scottish accent that I'm watching. So you know, I think all of those things uh, are questions that we don't always think about as well, is how that ripple effect, ripple effect might benefit everyone. I see our time is, is done. So I'm going to, I'm going to, unless, the, one couple more? OK, they're saying let's go for it. So let's, you, yeah, a couple more questions. Hi, my name is Sean Gray. I, I guess the question that I actually have is, do you think it would be beneficial if we, on a mainstream level, kind of sort of push the idea that there may never be a cure for disability? The idea that like disability can't be cured, I feel like if, if we're sort of okay with that, it would allow for the social implications part, the social idea of uh, disability being painful, maybe that might actually be better like it could be better if we actually just admit to ourselves that maybe disability can't be cured and maybe it shouldn't be cured who wants to tackle that I, yeah I think that that needs to be a, a fundamental part of the conversation because otherwise we have conversations that don't map to reality very well it's it's pretty well understood um, by a lot of philosophers and policymakers and advocates dealing with disability that disability is socially constructed. Like you might have a baseline medical condition or difference in ability or what have you, but then people's reactions to that and society's um, systems built around that make make you disabled. Um, and so what will happen is we might be able to fix some medical conditions. We might be able to bring everyone's abilities to some certain baseline. But then it just gets redefined. Who's left out of that? OK, now they're disabled. Um, I, I've seen science fiction um, you know, 
books and movies where, where no one's disabled. And that's just not realistic. There will be some new form of space paralysis. There will be some new thing where someone can't access the implant or the what have you, and now they're functionally disabled by that. Um, and I think if we had that element present in the conversation, um, we'd be able to have conversations that are just more tethered to reality, more about um, what, what technology do people want, what technology do people need, how do we spend these resources, what is disability actually about? Well said. Yeah, if you want to, sure. One more. I think you get the final question. Yeah, my question is, this is the 25th year anniversary of ADA, the American with Disabilities Act, and I was just curious uh, how we f see things going forward, what we want to celebrate, what, what we would change. That's what I'd like to hear the panelists talk about. I'd like to see a lot more conversation about disabilities and our social attitudes and responses to disabilities. Um, you know, to see whether things, how things have changed, if they've changed. We, and also, in speaking of celebrating, I'd like to see celebrations of diversity within the disability uh, community and conversation. Um, for me, I'm a member of what's called the ADA generation. I've never gone to school or had to be an adult and live on my own in a world without the ADA. Um, so I've grown up with a certain baseline assumption of rights, which means that I've also grown up noticing a lot of places where I'm supposed to have rights, but there are gaps or things fall short or implementation still after 25 years hasn't caught up with what it's supposed to be. Um, so I'd like to see some conversations around that. I think that kind of complements each other. And I, I think I would just add that often people assume that disability means no ability whatsoever. That, but it actually, if you look at the prefix, it's going to be a word nerd for a minute. It's apart from. So it sort of gives you a different definition of what ability is. It might be ability outside of what one considers to be ability. Um, what I'd like to see is more of a recognition of that. So instead of asking the question, or maybe in addition to asking the question, Will technology help us end disability? Maybe the question could be, as a follow-up to that, if we quote unquote end disability, what do we gain and what do we lose as a result of that? You know, there's a certain, certain skill set that people with disabilities kind of learn through being in a world, adapting to a world that wasn't built with them in mind, that didn't consider them during the planning. And I think if those things were acknowledged, if those skills were valued, if those things were incorporated, like the curb cut example that I brought up earlier, we'd all be better off. So I think that's it. Um, I, I just wanted to, for folks who haven't seen the film, to go back to what got us here today. The website is fixedthemovie.com. That's fixedthemovie.com. I know they're doing a push to make the film PBS ready so that more people can access it. You can find out about that on the website. Again, I want to thank the folks at Future Tense and uh, Arizona State University, New America, and Slate.com for having this conversation. Thank you. <laughs>